talk to me about cold. We've got hot. Cold, yeah. Cold exposure. Yeah. So deliberate cold exposure um, is another type of hormetic stress. And there's some overlap, but there's different, like you can increase heat shock proteins from cold exposure. Heat shock, heat, these stress response pathways, there's a lot of overlap where you can like, because it's just, it's it's an, it's an adaptation, right? We were meant to move. We were meant to be hot. We were meant to be cold. We were meant to get plant phytochemicals. We're there, you know, our, our bodies respond and we activate all these really beneficial genetic pathways. So they all kind of overlap. Some do it better than others. Like heat shock proteins are more robustly activated by heat. But cold also activates them. Just an interesting thing to to think about. Um, so cold exposure, one of the most robust physiological responses to cold res- cold exposure would be norepinephrine release. And we were talking uh, earlier about mood and like neurotransmitter optimization, things to do, like ha- behaviors you can engage in, and and timing of those behaviors around things that are you know perhaps. Um, going to require a better mood or more motivation or something like that, right? So cold, norepinephrine does play a role in 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 motivation and mood and those things. And like I got in the cold shower before I came here, and I usually do that before like a talk or you know something like that as well. But um, so norepinephrine release is one of the the most consistent physiological responses. You can get that from twenty seconds at like forty degree Fahrenheit water or two <clears throat> excuse me two minutes at um. 49 or 50 degree Fahrenheit water will, will release norepinephrine, norepinephrine twofold over baseline. Um, or you can be crazy and stay in like 50 degree water for an hour. Who does that? Um, and you'll get a fivefold increase. So um, why, we, why would you want norepinephrine? Well, it is a neurotransmitter. It does play a role in focus, attention. It regulates mood. Um, it helps with like anxiety. All those things are you know, important. So it's kind of I personally like to time it around things like cold exposure. Um, Also sort of benefits with respect to mitochondrial biogenesis. You can get in cold plunge and stay in there for 15 minutes and increase mitochondrial biogenesis markers in muscle tissue. So that's the growth of new mitochondria in your muscle tissue. That's great. Mitochondria are producing more energy. So it's associated with less muscle atrophy. But you can get that from a high intensity workout too. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to necessarily do cold. Um, when should you do the cold? So I, I can tell you when not to do it. When not to do it would be after sort of a strength training or resistance training workout. How long is the window? So, mo- so that's the good question. So I've come up with my own sort of window on this, and I can tell you the rationale behind that. But so here's the thing. There's been a couple of studies, and it's actually not all consistent. The first study that came out that was like the big, made the big deal um, it was like, I don't know, 2015 or so when it came out or something like that. And the, the study did, it was a cold ice bath and it was five minutes after a strength training workout where people, the, like the men went in and like put their leg or something like that in the, in the ice bath for 15 minutes. And this was right after the workout. Okay. Or they did passive recovery where they were actually on a stationary bike. So the control group wasn't just sitting around. They were actually, in my opinion, increasing hypertrophy by movement. Okay, it's just that's clear. I, I think that's a flaw of the study. And so the people that did the ice bath right after their work, their resistance training work at Howd still had hypertrophy, but they had less than the control group. Yep. And so that was, was like, oh, it's blunting gains. And so I was like, dive, back then I would dive into, I was trying to dive was into it understanding. leg or legs? I don't remember. Right. I was just wondering because it would be Interesting if they compared the to leg. The neck, neck, other leg, yeah. I don't I don't remember. Um, it's been so long since I've read that study. But uh, so when you are, when you're doing exercise, when you're doing resistance training, you're obviously causing an inflammatory response, right? That's part of the stress. And there's a counter to that. There's a very potent anti-inflammatory response. And um, with the with the resistance training, you're actually damaging muscle, right? You're damaging the muscle. It's like a mechanical force activating all sorts of pathways. Well, turns out that immune cells have to get to that muscle and that plays a role in in the hypertrophy. But like this whole response, if you look at like some of the cytokines and IGF-1 that's involved in, in signaling and all that, it happens like it peaks like an hour after resistance training. And then after that, it kind of goes back down. And so the question is, when you're getting in the cold, you're causing vasoconstriction. So norepinephrine, I mentioned, is a uh, neurotransmitter. It's also a hormone. It's made in the periphery as well. And it's involved in vasoconstriction, which is the opposite of what heat does, vasodilation. 
So when you're vasoconstricting, you're cutting off the roads to get to your muscle, right? Like the growth factors, the immune cells, all those things can't get there, right? You're, you're stopping that. I think this is what's happening. Uh, and so, you know, it's like, well, what if I just wait like an hour or two? Would I be safe? Possibly. Or maybe just, you know, do it at a few hours, like five hours. What's the rule you use? Five? Um, so I, I personally don't do as much, much cold exposure as I should do because I talk about it. I do it a lot more in the summer when it's hot. And but when I do do it, most of the time it's before something. I know it's like it's ridiculous, but it's the truth. Um, or I'll do it in the morning. Like, so I personally don't like to time it right after my heat exposure, mostly because blood pressure changes for me that are just freaky that I don't it's like. It's wild. Doing yeah. contrast therapy is very, yeah. very weird. It is. Yeah. I mean, some people like that, right? I, I enjoy it, but it's like a dizzy feeling. It's a dizzy. And I've had like even more extreme where it was like vertigo. And I had yep. like, it I've, was, had, I've had to yeah. sit on the side and just. Yeah, exactly. Stare at the floor and hope that it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not too like fond of that feeling. So I like to separate them, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit. Um, although I think if I, if I wait like five to 10 minutes after I get out of the sauna, like, and just kind of at room temperature, just chill out for a minute, let my heart rate come down. Then I get in the cold. I don't have that response. So like waiting a little bit. So um, I think the rule of thumb for cold exposure is I think that neurotransmitter optimization, optimization like when do you want to use it to get that norepinephrine hit? Because it does help with focus and tension. It helps with mood, anxiety. And so like, you know, if you want to like if you wake up in the morning first thing and do it, that's a great way to start the day. Hmm. Um, I like to wake up and get on my Peloton or do my workout, uh, but also just timing it around things. Like I said, I did a cold shower before I came here. Yep. Um, if I'm at home, I'll get into the cold plunge before something that, you know, is going to cause me more anxiety or just I need more focus and attention. So, so you mentioned uh, 20 seconds at 40 degrees is enough for the norepinephrine. But what about if we're looking for the full cascade, we're going to capture as much as we can most that is realistic for people to do how long, how frequently, how cold per week? So we talked about the norepinephrine and we talked a little bit about mitochondrial biogenesis, the growth of new mitochondria in skeletal muscle. And that was 15 minutes at 50 degrees, which if you can get to the three minute, three and a half minute mark at 50 degrees, you can get to 50. The rest of it's fine. Yeah. But um, there's another benefit we didn't talk about, which is actually making more mitochondria in your adipose tissue. And that's an adaptation that is a response to cold exposure because when you have more mitochondria in your fat you're you're basically making it's basically you're making more energy you burn more energy but you also release heat as a byproduct and so it's an adaptation the more you use the cold the it's called browning of fat and the reason for that is because when you look at a fat droplet under a microscope and there's more mitochondria in it it looks brown compared to white so so that's also something that happens and most of the studies looking at browning of fat in humans have not been done in getting into cold water they've been done in like humans walking around at 50 degree Fahrenheit or putting on a cold suit that's 50 degree Fahrenheit. I know it's like one of those things you like walk so around funny. with the air. Yeah. And, um, and so again, for those, I mean, it's, it's, it's anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour, you start to, you start to get that. So 15 minutes, I think is a good marker for, for a session, for a session, for you, the whole shebang, yep. right? Like not just the norepinephrine, but the mitochondrial benefits if you're also looking for browning of the fat yep. and, you know, the muscle. At what temperature? And so that would be like 50 degrees, 49 degrees Fahrenheit if, okay. you're, if you can, and which is, it's, I mean, that's cold. Frequency, 15 minutes, uh, 50 degrees. How often? I, I don't know that there's an established frequency like there is with the sauna, right? This isn't, like there's not large observational studies looking at people that are cold plunging. But I will tell you, so I talked to Dr. Lachunen about this. He said, well, what percentage of people in Finland, because the saunas are, the sauna studies are coming ground out of Finland. Z Finland's ground zero. Yeah, like are doing, because they a lot of people will just, they'll, they'll do, the, they have like these public saunas, as it's called, and the community will get in there and then they go in like in the wintertime, they just go into the Baltic and jump in and it's cold. And I, I've been there, I've experienced it, I've seen it. So um, he was saying about 10% of people, I was actually thought it was going to be more than that, uh, but it's not. About 10% of the people are are doing, are going, doing contrast therapy. So they're going from hot to cold. 
So then you, have, you go, oh, well, because I wanted to know, I was like, are some of these benefits like from the contrast? And there's not a lot of research on it, you know. So it, the, the question is, like, I, I don't I don't think that you can give a frequency like with absolute confidence. Four that, to seven times per week. Exactly. Blah, blah. Yeah. So it's more of a, OK, well, are you looking for these browning of fat? Is that because it'll go away when you stop doing it? So you have to keep it up. Um, and the more you do it, it is kind of dose dependent. So what do you try and do? I told you that I don't do enough cold exposure unless it's the summer. What would you try and do? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so I look, I feel great. I felt great this morning when I was doing my cold shower, right? Like I like to use it for that like mood booster. Acute sort of performance enhancer. So it's enhancer. an acute performance enhancer, that neurotransmitter optimization thing. That's why, I, that's why I like to use it. And every time I do it, I'm like, why don't do I this do more. this more? I know why, because I'm doing the hit and the muscles and then I'm the mom and I like at yep. the podcast and yep. that, you know, so it's like, that's, it's almost like, I think it's almost easier to just, at least if it's winter to just get into the cold shower because it's like less of like something about the cold plunge. You got to like lift it, the lid, lift the lid. You got to lift the lid. It. You got to think about it. You're like, oh, it's the cold plunge. And I got to get past that, that three, three and a half minute mark where, you know, you're burning and then you're not burning. So um, I think I think that I just le- would like to start using it on a more of a daily basis for the way it makes me feel. And that's why I like it mostly. It seems to me based on what you're saying here that although there is definitely a place for cold exposure and deliberate cold exposure has some effect that you don't capture with the sauna, if you were to make a pie chart of what's happening with heat and cold, a lot of it is coming from heat and only a little bit of it is coming from cold. Yeah, when we're talking about a lot of these health outcomes with respect to cardiovascular disease and dementia and all cause mortality all it is it's all but you know again the hot is mimicking moderate intensity exercise. So yeah, that makes sense. Um the cold I I I really just it come all comes back again to that it makes you feel so good you're getting that norepinephrine. Yep. It does brown your fat and like look, browning of fat is a therapeutic target for many researchers that have been researching this now and for you know over a decade where there it, it it's it's being looked at to help as a treatment for type 2 diabetes because you do improve metabolic health like from browning of fat but compare that to like exercise diet what you're eating i don't know that it matters i don't know that the cold even compares like don't i don't even know that we should be talking about the metabolic benefits of it when you're when there's like so much more bang for your buck that's from sprinkling on the top of the icing on the top of the yeah cake. exactly and it's like okay i'm making more mitochondria and my muscles but i want to be doing hit and vigorous exercise for all the other benefits and guess what i get mitochondrial biogenesis from that like pretty robustly 